Teachers, this is Joy J. Moore. Just wanted to remind you that the Working Preacher Fall Campaign is ending soon on November 30th. You still have time to make an impact for preachers around the globe. Go to workingpreacher.org to make your gift during the campaign and your gift will be matched dollar for dollar. We need your help in order to continue providing resources to church leaders like you. Thank you for supporting this vital work. Don't forget, make your gift during the campaign to unlock a free ebook titled Youthful Sermons. Youthful Sermons is a workbook to help young people preach their first sermon with mentoring from their pastor. Thank you for partnering with us in this ministry. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the first Sunday of Advent. Happy Advent, everyone, and happy lectionary new year are from Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 16, Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. Our second reading is First Thessalonians. Oh, that was a that was a mouthful this morning. First Thessalonians 3, 9 through 13. And now we have moved into the Gospel of Luke, year C, with Luke 21, 25 through 36. Happy Advent. Happy Advent. I haven't changed my decorations yet. So I apologize that I didn't get my Advent decorations out. You're still looking at my fall decorations. I have, Lord I Jesus. Have candles. I have candles. Awesome. You have a tree. <laughs> and and Rolf has a cat. Bandit the cat. Bandit the cat. Bandit Bandit the podcast. Pod cat. He's our podcast on our other podcast. Well, happy Advent, everyone. And here we are in that first Sunday of Advent, year C, Gospel of Luke. So the first thing I think we need to think about is like you know, just getting our head around the fact that we're now in a different gospel and how does that, of course, change to the way uh, we move through Advent and, and, of course, through the coming year? And I think it's worth it for the preacher to consider that. How is Luke going to accompany us uh, through this next, through this particular season of Advent as we're podcasting now, but through the whole year and the ways in which uh, certain themes of this gospel uh, we can lift up uh, on, this, on this first Sunday? And as we move through Advent, and in particular, how is it that uh, how is it that the specificity of these passages in Luke really shape our Advent time? I know that we have certain themes that we lift up in Advent in terms of waiting and expectation and prepare, preparation and such, and those are all wonderful, fine themes, Advent themes. But the way in which inviting preachers and inviting sermons and inviting our people to think about what is it particularly that these that these texts are offering that that help us or that help us think about what going through advent is going to mean this year at this time and and how is it that they're speaking to uh, an, an advent in 2021 uh, that uh, words that we need to hear. So that's a general observation. I have more specifics about that for Luke, but uh, but I wanted to start with that. I guess I would add, as well as waiting and those traditional Advent themes of comfort, I would add terror when it comes to Luke 21, 25 through 36, and just a revolutionary feel to what's going on here. So I was reading this text, I thought, imagine this is your first time in church, and this is the, the thing that they stand up and read, and <laughs> you just think, you know, signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, nations confused by the roaring of the waves, people fainting in fear, foreboding of what's coming, which of course sounds evergreen, but it, you know, it has its own way of echoing right now, but then stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. which is such a peculiar thing to say in that moment. And you can see how people take that and run it in some really 
dangerous and if not abusive ways uh, in their religion. But to think about what does it mean to be comforted or what does it mean to live in the midst of such fear and anxiety and, and to have that kind of comfort. Audrey West wrote a, a really nice commentary, but she's got this one line where she just starts a paragraph, to whom does the future belong? And so I think that's the trick is how does a preacher go from a text that sounds so terrifying to that question or how the text um, crystallizes that question, to whom does the future belong? Because that's what, that's what would keep me in church. <laughs> the scripture text read all by itself would scare me to death. I appreciate that, Matt, in the sense of uh, remembering who it is that is listening. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, I fear right now. I, I sense uh, that foreboding right now. Uh, I, it, I, I'm in the midst of distress. And, and when I say that, I'm not making uh, some type of, you guys need to come over and hug me right now. Uh, I mean, the, the times that we're living in right now, uh, everyone seems to be uh, caught in some way and in need of, of some promise that what we're living through right now is, is not the end. Uh, and so, uh, as you say, leaning into the promise um, is is the good news that makes that, that for me, if I were thinking as you pose the question, that person who for the first time is coming into to, to a worship service, a gathered community of believers and hears these words, uh, I wonder if what might not stick out for them is, first of all, that this generation will not pass away until these things are happening. Check. I'm in that generation. It's happening right now. Promise. But the words of God, the words of Christ uh, will not pass away. And so watch out. Don't um, don't be weighed down uh, it, it, because that 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 turns you that traps you away from what the promise of peace is and if if uh, a sermon leans into it from that reality of distress and that reality of of fear then the promise becomes um, as powerful a word as it was in the first century when they too were experiencing distress and needed a promise I think to some extent, these, the description, this cosmological description of, uh, you know, this, the apocalyptic uh, reality might be exactly, as you said, Joy, what, what people are experiencing, what people are feeling uh, in, a, in a way in which, in a, in a way in which still here we are, that the, a, a kind of sense of the roaring, even the roaring of the sea and the waves and the way in which, uh, the way in which our foundations have been literally uh, upended in so many ways. And so I think there's a, I think there's a kind of reality and a truth telling here of, of what we're actually feeling. And at the same time, one thing that I, I am drawn to in this particular passage is an invitation for interpretation of the signs there will be signs. What will these signs be? What will these signs look like? And and yet, and and an invitation to stand up and raise your head and look around and say, how how will we interpret how are we interpreting the signs that we're seeing right now? And and the signs that we have seen, what are they pointing to? That's what signs do. What are they pointing to? And how can we interpret those signs together? But we do that from a place of looking forward in the passage. We do that from a place of uh, in in prayer and uh, and and that and that coming of community of together and promise of, as you said, of that things will not pass away. And so there's a at the same time, it, you know, there is a kind of. Um, yeah, there's a kind of foreboding here, but I, I wonder if people will hear it as like, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm here in this community to, to interpret signs together and to see where, see where, what's, where it's pointing, um, particularly in this Advent, as we look, look to what, it, what will be, what will Advent point to this year? <laughs> Uh, last year, uh, N.T. Wright uh, uh, 
wrote a book, uh, uh, I think it was, it was called Broken Signposts. And uh, it's an uh, interesting read, I think, because what it does is it names the places where we thought we understood the markers of what is going to be that in the midst of the pandemics we're in, uh, the, um, the continued virus, the um, uh, political unrest, the racial division, the, um, the, the clim climax, cl clim the fact that the earth is quaking and fires are raging and famine is across the land, um, uh, that creation itself is groaning. Um, what do those signs point us to? And they point us to the need for something very different, a reality that is very different than the one that we're experiencing. How does the gospel offer us um, that uh, alternative reality? Um, that for me would be a lean in uh, in the midst of brokenness. Every now and then, in church, we read these texts or read a text that I think makes people say, what in the world am I doing here? Like, why, why did I get up early and drive in for this? Uh, and this is one of those, I think. And not because it's, you know, because the text is so odd, but just the way the text speaks to a reality that we would rather ignore, uh, the way the text says things that don't make us say, well, that's not real, but that say, oh, that is real. And my Sunday would have been a lot more convenient had I just stayed home and made a nice brunch and watched TV or something and not have to think about these life or death issues or these cosmic issues. And, but why do we keep coming back? Why do we keep coming back to community? Why do we keep coming back to worship, keep coming back to God? Um, and Advent's a good time to think about that, I, I think. And a text like this, which you know, it's such a jolt to the senses on the Sunday after Thanksgiving, <laughs> and you're starting to make your Christmas list, maybe you've already bought your tree, you know, you're just making these transitions, and you've got a lot to do, and all of the, and add, and here's a text that just says, what are you going to do about this? Uh, or what are you going to hope for? Or again, to whom does the future belong, and how does your life live in that reality or not? Um, yeah, don't, I'd say to preachers, don't run from this text, because it's hard. That's exactly what I was going to say, Matt. Don't run from it. Uh, I think some of the criticisms that uh, folks are rightly making about the church is that we've tried to, to live um, on, on Christmas Day in, instead of the, um, uh, the hustle and bustle of the things that you just described, buying a tree, making your list, uh, preparing dinner, uh, inviting people to the next holiday. Um, that in itself is a hustle and bustle that can be very stressful. And then you, 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 you uh, multiply that into the, the stress of, uh, of the larger reality around us. So just to reiterate, don't run away from this because it, to do other than that would be to be hypocritical and then the gospel loses its power. Which is why, what's the best season of all? Advent. Well, I Expectation. Think, this is what the church was made for this season. So go ahead, Caroline. Well, I think too, uh, you know, one of the interesting aspects about this passage is that you, it does open with this, you know, apocalyptic fear and foreboding and, uh, but the but the way in which Advent is really a shaking of the foundations of our world, and it should be that that God would enter into our time and space and 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 all of humanity, um, and we'll see this next week where all flesh will see the salvation of our Lord, and so there is a kind of uh, there is a kind of sense of maybe recapturing that with Advent, that this is, it's, it's not just a, a you know, a, a waiting around and, and waiting, what are you actually waiting for? You're waiting for actually the world to be fundamentally changed. And, uh, and then also in the midst of that kind of prophetic speech of Jesus, there is a, a turn, I think here to a, a kind of a pastoral move with regard to the fig tree 
that the, the promise that they will be able, we, we, we are able to interpret the signs around, uh, around us. And again, this interpretation, uh, invitation to an interpretation through watchfulness and prayer. And, uh, and, the, and the promise of the fig tree that in the, mid, in the midst of, you know, what you will be able to see what, uh, what is coming and, and the kind of advent of God's presence. Uh, but again, we do that. I mean, why do we come back to church? Why do we, why do we, because we can't do it alone. I think that's, that's the other thing that maybe Advent can remind us of is that, that the things that we are called to see and the things that we are called to give witness to, we can't do that on our own. We do that through this kind of watchfulness and prayer that takes a community of believers. And so I, I, do, I do hear that also in this passage and, and a potential way to move through Advent. If, if you will let me, and I'll, I'll stop if you won't, um, but uh, you, you talk about the pastoral piece, and, and it, it draws me to um, uh, the um, uh, Thessalonians uh, reading uh, from 1 Thessalonians, uh, uh, our second reading, uh, which, um, which the verse 11 sounds like it would be a great benediction or a great ending a kind of liturgical move and and you know say goodbye but in the context of uh of the church in Thessalonica when this was written it it's a, a time when the people were focused on the second coming of Christ as imminent and um i i was reminded of that because uh before you were were saying that Caroline uh, Matt had said to us, you know, what, what what's the best season? And if you think of Advent as the first coming and ignore that it is the second coming, um, uh, we miss the fact that uh, here in uh, this particular passage, folks were, you know, I don't have to worry about what's happening in my world, in my space and place. You use that word, Caroline, because. Jesus is coming back and then everything will be okay and and I think in the context of people who were so focused on the return of Christ uh, then the present that the blessing in first Thessalonians is a call to stand in the face of uh, all that needs to be rebuilt all that has been destroyed all that seems to have been lost, uh, all that uh, causes us to wonder what is going on, to hold to an anticipation that I'm not the only one. I'm part of a community that has this hope that the Creator has not given up on a promise for things to be better. And um, so I I'm, I'm coming back to church. I'm coming week after week to be reminded that others have this hope too. And it's not that the baby came 2,000 years ago, it's that Christ will return. And how much of what I'm doing day to day is a glimpse of the kingdom that his return will usher in? Yeah, my favorite, uh, my favorite um, banjo to play on in Advent, uh, we always hear at this time of year that Advent is Matt's favorite season of the year. And uh, I always uh, repeat something I learned from a Catholic priest named John Sankovitz, uh, that Advent is about Christ coming in history, mystery, and majesty. So uh, you've been leaning into that majesty, the second coming, and that is a theme in Advent. That's why we have the Luke reading. Uh, but I, I also think, uh, especially the recent emphasis on missional theology is to talk about how God is inbreaking the world now all around us and to be attentive to that. Um, I'm not sure any of these texts um, do a great job of helping us with, uh, with that. Maybe Psalm 25 does. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure if we're done with Luke yet, but um, leaning into um, the, the Jeremiah reading, it's... Um, Jeremiah, this is from the book of Consolation. You know, it's the only part of Jeremiah we really read. And I don't know if I would add verses, but for sure, um, I invite preachers to, to read the following verses after, after verse 16 in chapter 33, 
uh, because one of the things it does is uh, it says this, that uh, I love this. If any of you could break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night would not come at their appointed time, only then would my covenant with my servant David be broken so, so that the, uh, the fidelity of God to creation and the fidelity of God to God's promises to Israel um, uh, uh, are equally strong. Uh, and, and to me, that's a good place to, to, um, to think about Christ's coming to us uh, in the manger, in the baby, Christ coming to us uh, in the future, and um, the surprising ways in which that future breaks into the now. I love that, Rolf. Um, and I guess, uh, I don't know if I would say adding verses to uh, Thessalonians, but putting it in its context. Um, if uh, we talked uh, last week about um, um, kingdoms and, and what we think of as kingdoms. And um, in, in the ancient world, the, um, the, the culture understood all of this language. And one of the things that is um, uh, central in this is, is this idea of uh, when, it, I'll, I'll use a contemporary, I'll try to use a contemporary model of it, is when there's a disaster, a flood or uh, a, a, a hurricane or, or something like that, um, um, our president will go to that area and kind of scout it out. And basically, it's supposed to be when the government is going to offer some way of support for that community. And uh, in ancient times, that would happen um, with the expectation that the king or the emperor would return to get an accounting of how people have dealt with what the uh, king has given. And uh, so I think that's precisely what you're calling us to, Ralph, is... Um, this isn't about this pie in the sky, hope in the future. This is recognizing that what we do in those incredible inbreaking of the presence of God that we um, that we will miss that are right before us uh, in in our life uh, today um, it is what I call a glimpse of what God promises. But it's also what we will be account held accountable for? What have you done with this promise that the disaster is not the end? If God is, is uh, filling us with the Holy Spirit so that we can be God with flesh on, that we can be God with flesh on, when Christ returns, how will we be, um, how will our lives have been evident of glimpses of God? Um, not for ourselves, but for those around us. Yeah, Joy, I think that's a really helpful way of helping Thessalonians speak, especially alongside of, of, of the Lucan text, that it's not just wait around. <laughs> your only work is to raise your head when your redemption is near. You know, it's not sit tight and wait to be rescued, but the church's response, the people of God's response to this otherwise apparently hopeless situation beyond our own fix, ability to fix uh, is about love and it's about holiness. To go back to First Thessalonians, uh, which are things you can rely upon God to do, uh, and that get can be tested, right? Can be, we'll talk about fruits for righteousness, or fruits of repentance, um, next week when when John the Baptizer shows up, and th th yeah, there's a call to this that, that Advent isn't just a woe is me time, but it's a, a uh, an alarm bell that says that if the church can do anything in these horrible times, it's not going to fix the the, the roaring of the waves and the changing of the, the heavenly bodies, it can be a community of love, it can be a community of holiness uh, and of grieving and of protection. And I just have to note that the Presbyterian among us just talked about holiness in a very clear way. Thank you very much. Well, it's in the Bible, so I figured we should probably take it seriously. I didn't even say anything about, I didn't even use any of the words. I didn't, I said holiness, not sanctification. And yeah, but it's all there, isn't it? It's all there, it yeah. is. How about that? I would only point out that Jeremiah clearly says is the Lord is our righteousness. Amen. So I, I do love Psalm 25. Um, and, and, and here's where I think Psalm 25 maybe 
does um, help uh, in this way. Uh, first of all, just to note, it is a prayer. Uh, it is a prayer uh, of um, a self, <clears throat> you know, the opening line to you, O oh Lord, I lift up my self. It's a prayer of, uh, I can't find the right word, so I'm just of giving of the self to God. But then it's a, a prayer for enlightenment. Make me to know your paths. Lead me in your truth. I wait for you all day long. And that um, as the days in the Northern Hemisphere are getting shorter, and as we do wait and prepare for Christmas, there's a sense that in Advent to wait for God all day long and to, to learn to discern uh, God's presence in your daily life is, uh, I, I just think of that is a wonderful uh, addition to the, to my Advent um, spiritual life. Well, and to go back to, to Luke, I mean, how is it that we are interpreting the signs? How is it that, uh, that we are attentive to uh, God's presence among us, and the the answer, if you will, not the answer, but you know what I mean, is uh, praying that you have the strength to escape all these things that will take place. And of course, those all those things uh, are all the the previous things that Jesus uh, has already talked about about the destruction of the temple and destruction of Jerusalem. And so it's it, there's some serious things. Uh, that that are that are coming, but it the the answer or the the way in which we are that we that we are able to interpret the signs and that we are able to see the presence of God is prayer. And so I think that you you mentioning that Rolf can be a really that could be a really helpful connection for people to say if that's the direction that the sermon goes about how is it that how is it that we are able to, uh, to, to able, able to wait in this kind of waiting that is, that is not passive, but that is very, that is active. And how is it we're able to interpret the signs? It's prayer. And so then pray this prayer and, and, and invite people to pray it every single day this week as they move into the Advent season and what it means and what difference does it make to pray this prayer each and every day uh, in this first week of Advent, I think would be really meaningful for people. I love that. And uh, leaning from um, uh, Jeremiah, uh, the Lord is our righteousness, into what this prayer in Psalm lifts up is uh, that we are asking to be led into God's truth. We are asking for God to teach us. Uh, we are acknowledging that that God is uh, the one of our salvation. And uh, in verse seven, um, that it is according to God's steadfast love that we are reaching out to God, that we are seeking God. Um, I, I love that. 